Matthew chapter 13, we're starting with verse 44. All right, we're going to read, uh, starting with verse 44, because there's two parables that are going to be just uh, uh, put into it. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. And when he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up to the shore, sat down, and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand all these things? Yes, they replied, we do. Then he added, every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. 53. When Jesus had finished telling these stories and illustrations, he left that part of the country. He returned to Nazareth, his hometown. And when he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, Where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just the carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe him. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. It's a joy to be here tonight. And as we now delve into the word of God, let us just stop for a moment of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Your word is truth, Lord. It is deep, Lord. And tonight, Lord, I pray that as I share this word, Lord, that it will go and perform the work which you have called it to do. Because you have written in your word that it does not return void, but accomplishes every purpose for which you send it. And so, Father, we commit this word to you. Help me to speak only those words that you want me to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this concept of net value and prophetic honor. And this concept of net value is often revealed when we attend a celebration of life event. And what do I mean by a celebration of life event? Well, this past year, we laid to rest our dear daddy, our father, my father-in-law and pastor's uh, dear father. And yesterday, um, Brother Alfred from our Mishraf service, we had a celebration of life service for him. You see, net value in the kingdom of heaven reminds us of the true meaning and purpose of life. It reminds us of heavenly values and perspectives that actually need to be part of our daily life. That is what Jesus came to do, is to make the kingdom principles, the kingdom values reality. And we'll be looking at today the heavenly parables and also heavenly realities that come through the word of God. You see, Jesus gives meaning and purpose and motive in living life, a life to please God, a life that honors him, a life that reflects the truth about the kingdom. And as we move on to the next slide, I've broken up this series of uh, parables and verses 
into six portions. The first one and the second one, the hidden treasure, and, and that was a parable. And then there was the parable of the pearl of great price. They're actually twin parables. Then the one that we're going to focus on today are the parable of the net and the parable of the teacher, the prophet without honor, and then the relationship of faith and miracles. So we're reminded of eternal value of the kingdom as we attend celebration of life services. And yesterday, Brother Alfred's daughter gave such a wonderful testimony of her father. He left a legacy. He deposited kingdom treasure into his children, into their hearts. How did he do it? through his generosity, through the love he had for all people, through the joy and his right living, he deposited a treasure, the treasure of knowing Jesus. We need reminders of our mortality because it helps us to focus. It helps to focus on eternal issues and refocus. It refocus, setting our hearts our minds, our affections on things above, Colossians 3, 2 says, and not on things of the earth. And this is what the whole season of prayer and fasting does. It helps us to focus our spiritual energy towards Jesus in a more intentional, intense, and dynamic way. And I have to say, whenever we've had these prayer and fastings, we've seen amazing breakthroughs, miracles happen in people's lives because we are aligning ourselves, pressing into God, asking him to do the impossible. And many of us here have been in those situations where we've had impossibilities. And we've had to wrestle through with God as Jacob wrestled with the angel. And he was known as one who prevailed with God. How do we prevail? Through that sometimes agonizing, wrestling through until we see what God does. And we're not even knowing what he'll do. But we're wrestling through in prayer, believing him for the impossible. This is what prayer does. And so um, you have that opportunity today to join in on that. Getting back to the word here now, we did the next slide talks about the first parable that we looked at, the first and the second parable. They're twins. They kind of walk hand in hand because they agree about the treasure. They agree in the presentation. The treasure is hidden. The treasure needs to be looked for. And as we found out, one treasure was discovered. But the pearl had to be searched for, which Roger did such a good job of expounding the other day. They, so they diverged in their discovery. One just discovered it walking along. He discovered the treasure. The other had to pursue it and look for it. But finally... They all agree they had to sell everything to get the treasure. And that's where we left off. But what is this treasure? What is the treasure? It's not physical. It's the deepest meaning of treasure is the wealth of the human soul. The human soul being rich, having God as its very own. And that's why Jesus came. So we could have God for our very own. And that's where we were last week. And now we're going to turn our focus, starting on the next verses, where we begin with the parable of the net. And it starts, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net. And when we look at this net, and we think about the kingdom of heaven, we understand from the scriptures that the king, heaven itself is mentioned 700 times in the scriptures. The kingdom of heaven, 80 times in the New Testament. And here in this chapter, eight times the kingdom of heaven is mentioned. Well, what is this kingdom of heaven? It's a process 
of a course of events whereby God begins to govern, to act as king, and God's actions manifest his lordship in the lives, in the world of men and women. God wants to make himself real to us. And the reign of God, we have to press into God. We have to search for him. We have to seek him. Some of us discovered him through uh, accident or through agony or through situations. We came to know Christ. But it is a process. The kingdom is now. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, you've entered into the kingdom. You are living in the kingdom of God now. And yet there's a kingdom yet to come. And that is the fulfillment. And we'll be talking about that. The kingdom of heaven in its fullness is coming and is ahead of us. And we anticipate it. As believers, we are partners, co-laborers in the work of manifesting God's will here and now through being led by God's spirit by knowing his word but also we are in expectation of God's full reign his full lordship at the end of the age now the kingdom of heaven can also be defined as the spiritual realm over which God reigns as king and um the fullness, we, as I said, of God's kingdom is going to be established at the end of the age. And the Apostle Paul makes this comments about the kingdom of heaven. It has three essential qualities. And it's outlined in Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of heaven is not about eating and drinking, but about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And as an aside, there was a, a, a frustrated mother one day trying to correct her mischievous son. He was always getting into trouble. And so she said, Dylan, how will you get to heaven when you were so naughty? And Dylan answered his mom, when I get to the pearly gates, mom, I'm going to run in and out slamming those gates until St. Peter says to me, you either stay in Dylan or you get out. <laughs> but our goal, our goal is to ensure we are in, we are in Christ, we are in the kingdom. For being truly in Christ is the key. It's the key. It's the treasure. It's the way we enter into the kingdom of heaven. We're going to move into some realities now about this kingdom. The kingdom of heaven has a time frame. And that is what this parable is speaking about. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets but threw the bad away. And I remember in Tanzania going down to the ocean shore and watching those fishermen. They were dragging in their nets and you could see them literally taking out those things that they couldn't eat and throwing them away and keeping the good fish for consumption or for sale. So the kingdom has a time frame. And as we've gone through Matthew 13, we've seen that there's a time to sow. There's a time to sow seed. There's a time for the growth of that seed and we looked at there's different types of soil that are helpful for growth and that are harmful for growth. And then there's the parable of weeds that somehow get into our seed. And we know that the enemy sows those things. We find that in verse 24. But then there's a time to produce. There's a time when there's fruit that comes and we all love it when we get those special fruits that are ripe at certain times of the season. We all love mango season. <laughs> um, but there's a time to harvest. 
And really, as we look at this parable, it moves in here now on verse 49. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We see that there is this, this time frame that's going to happen at the end of the age. And so we see that there is a time frame in this kingdom. But the secondly, second reality is that this kingdom is costly. And we've already seen that people, those, those merchants were willing to sell everything to have Jesus. Because true, true treasure is faith in Christ. He who knew no sin became sin to free us, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The kingdom of heaven begins with salvation and it meets our deepest needs. And what are our deepest needs? Our deepest need is to have sin dealt with. We need forgiveness. We need identity. We need to know what is my purpose and meaning of life. What, Lord, am I born to do for your kingdom? And I can remember at five years old, asking my father, Daddy, why am I born? Daddy, what am I supposed to do? Daddy, where do I go when I die? Every child has that question. Every human being wants to know what is their purpose and what is the meaning of life. And that began me on a journey of searching, just like the merchant. <laughs> I was searching for that treasure. I knew I was missing something. I told my daddy, daddy, when I asked him about that, he said, oh, dust to dust and ashes to ashes. That's all there is. And I said, daddy, I don't believe it. <laughs> In my five-year-old little uh, ability to stand tall, I, I, I actually didn't agree with my father. And it was a journey of searching like the merchant until I found Jesus. So the reality is when we look at this net is that it scoops up both good and evil. The good and the bad fish all came in. They all came in in this net. And it reminds me of Matthew 22.10, the parable of the wedding banquet. There was a man holding a, a big wedding and he invited all kinds of guests, but they had all kinds of excuses and they didn't come. Now, the master of this wedding was quite angry and frustrated. So he said to his servants, go out and call everyone in, gather all the people. And so it says they gathered all the people they could, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was full. And now the master of this wedding, the ceremony, comes looking and he sees some guest that isn't dressed properly. And he said, my friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man couldn't answer. He couldn't answer. He was speechless. He didn't know what to say. And the master of the ceremony said, tie him up hand and foot and throw him out into outer darkness. For many are invited but few are chosen. And I used to struggle. What do you mean, Lord? Many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are invited, but few are chosen. And it's very interesting. <laughs> Why? Why? They were invited, but they didn't come in their garments. They didn't come in their wedding clothes. And it speaks to us of the marriage of the Lamb. It speaks to us of Jesus Christ giving us his robes of righteousness when we enter into salvation. We exchange our dirty, filthy rags of our works that we think are so good. And he gives us his robes of righteousness. That's what it's speaking about. The wedding guest somehow snuck in there, but he wasn't dressed properly. He hadn't accepted Christ. He hadn't received the righteous garments. And this is how the kingdom of heaven is. It scoops up everyone. So the reality of the kingdom is that it separates. It separates 
There's a judgment that happens. There's a separation. And in verse 49, we see that the reality of this kingdom will purge. The kingdom of heaven purges gross and net evil. Because at the end of the age, the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. And you know, there's some who pretend that they're serving the Lord. <laughs> And that's where we get the, the whole parable of the, of the weeds and, and coming into the good seed. And remember what Jesus said, don't, no, don't go pull up the weeds. Don't go pull up the weeds, you'll pull up the good wheat as well. Wait until the end of the age. Wait until the hour is right for God's angels to come and sift out the good and the bad. Now, at the end of the age, Matthew 24, 36 makes it clear no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So the return of Christ is only known by the Father. And if you know anything about uh, some wedding traditions, uh, in Israel, one of the wedding traditions is that the groom must prepare a wedding chamber for his bride. And the, the father is the one who decides if the wedding chamber is ready. And only when the father says it's ready can the groom run with all of his attendants... There's a whole bunch of them, and they run to the bride's house. They scoop her up with all her maids, and they take them to the place of the wedding. Only the father. He comes in, and he inspects the room. And when he says it's ready, then there's this great commotion and loud noise, and the bride can hear the noise coming down the street. <laughs> I think they must make an arrangement. We're going to make as much noise so you know we're coming. <laughs> So it makes sense. This story makes sense when you know the tradition and we are waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now angels, agalos, 177 times in New Testament, 108 in the Old Testament. They are messengers from God and they can be human or divine, but they communicate and proclaim the will of God. They were part of God's creation, Psalm 148, 1 to 5, Nehemiah 9, 6, and Colossians 1, 16. They were created before man in Job 38, 4 to 7. There are many of them. 2 Kings 6, 16 to 17, we can remember when Elijah opened the eyes of Gehazi to see all of the angels around when they thought, when Gehazi thought that they were going to be finished off. And he saw the army of angels, the host, the host, the, the Lord of hosts army, Army angels were all around. There's many. They're spirit beings. Hebrew 1.14 and Luke 24.39. They're unseen unless God determines in his sovereign will that you need to see one. Has anybody seen an angel? I have. <laughs> in a vision and in a dream. In my salvation dream, two angels, and, and you know what? Angels are huge. <laughs> they're, they're like Boeing 747s. They're not these small little fluffy creatures. <laughs> the ones I saw were huge, and they accompanied me, and they accompanied me down into the center of this, this arena, and, and there, was, there was this pulsating light, and there was a man preaching the word, and the angels came on either side, and they said, you must jump into the light. I didn't know what that meant, <laughs> but I jumped I jumped into the light, and when I jumped through into the light, I found myself in a different kingdom. I had come into the kingdom of God, and everything was new. 
They're powerful. They're intelligent. Second Samuel 14, 17. But they do have their limitations. And Matthew talks about that in Matthew 24, 36. And Daniel 10.10, 10. we know that Gabriel came out, the archangel, to do, to do business because he heard Daniel praying and he came. He started to come out and the prince of Persia opposed him, a spiritual being opposed him. And he was delayed. And Daniel thought, God's not hearing my prayer. You might say today, I don't think God hears my prayer. But what did what did the angels say to Daniel? The first moment you began to pray, I was dispatched. Hallelujah. Every prayer is heard in heaven. Every prayer is there's a response from heaven. So keep on praying. Don't give up. Because Daniel thought God wasn't hearing him. And 21 days later, he found out God heard the first word of his prayer and responded to the first word of his prayer. That should encourage us, saints, to keep on praying. Well, you know, after these parables, Jesus turns now to his disciples in verse 51. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? And I like how they're just so bold. Yes, we understand. We understand. He's questioning his disciples, but it's also a question for us. Do we understand kingdom realities? It's difficult to understand kingdom realities when we're living in this physical world. But the kingdom of heaven is as real as we are sitting here today. And actually it is more real because there is an eternal value and consequence to this kingdom. And how we live in it, how we move in it, how we work in it, what we say, what we do. It will affect how we live. It should affect how we live. But there were people in Jesus' own disciples who did not understand. Can we think of one? I can think of one. Judas. He was one of the 12. But he didn't understand kingdom reality. He did not understand the kingdom of heaven. He was quietly pilfering money out of the offering bag. <laughs> Using it for himself. So being in church... And being a disciple, because Judas was a disciple, does not guarantee that we have access to this heavenly kingdom. There's not a guarantee, except for if you are in Christ and you have accepted him as your personal savior, you've confessed your shortcomings before him and you've received him as the savior of your soul. But then there has to be some Evidence, as James says, show me your faith and I will show you my works. <laughs> there has to be some out, there has to be some evidence of this kingdom reality in our life. We need to pursue it. We need to reflect Jesus. We need to store up its treasures. The other reality is that the kingdom treasures are old and new. In verse 52, we're looking now at the parable of the teacher. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple, note, I've underlined that, in the kingdom of heaven is like, here we go into the, another parable, the owner of a house who brings out his storeroom new treasure, as well as old. Kingdom treasures are old and they are new. We all have treasures at home, something that our great grandmother gave us, that beautiful vase or that piece of jewelry. It's a treasure to us. It was given to us. And then we have new treasures, things that we have bought that we treasure and we put them in a special place. When we have a treasure, we keep it in a special box or a special place. Sometimes we lock our treasures up in a safe. But the reality here is that not all teachers are disciples. 
There were many teachers of the law among the Pharisees and Sadducees, but they were not disciples of Jesus. They were not following him. In fact, they were trying to find ways to get rid of Jesus. A discipled teacher learns through the word, learns through the spirit, and learns through praxis. What does that mean? It means I learn about Jesus through reading his word, studying his word. I learn to hear the voice of the spirit, and I learn to walk in and by the spirit. These three things are so key to being a true disciple. And when we look at the Old and New Testament, it connects and it draws on one another. Both are required to know God deeper. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, Christ's genealogy is laid out. The foundation of Christ's work is established in the Old Testament. And Jesus explains himself through to his disciples, through from Moses, through to all the prophets who ever spoke about him. He used the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus uses the Old Testament measure to refute Satan during his temptation in the desert. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Satan was telling him, look, you're hungry, you're fasting. Turn those stones into bread. You can do it. You're God. And Jesus used the Old Testament and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he tempted him again to worship him. And he goes back to Deuteronomy 6.13. So Jesus used the Old Testament as a defense against the enemy's tactics. And you can read about his full temptation in Luke 4, 1-13. So let's look a little bit at treasure, the sorrows in the Greek, stored up, stored treasure, a way to store properly. But guess where that storehouse is, my friends? <laughs> it's in our thoughts, it's in our hearts. So as a man thinks, so he is. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Remember Mary, when she was hearing in Matthew 2.19 about all the stories about Jesus and the shepherds telling about his divine birth and spreading the word. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The kingdom, heaven of, the kingdom of heaven values thoughts and motives of our hearts and our minds. Those are the things that are so important to the Lord. Proverbs 16, 1, 3 says, All the ways of a man are clean and innocent in his own eyes. He may see nothing wrong with his actions. But the Lord weighs and examines the motives, intents of the heart. And he knows the truth. The Lord is interested in our thoughts our heart's motive. Why are we doing things? And we can see this coming out when we look at the motive of Judas. What was Judas' motive in his heart? It was greed and avarice. What about Ananias and Sapphira? They wanted glory. They wanted to be seen as people who were great because they gave so much in the church. What about Gehazi, the servant of Elisha? who wanted the money from Naaman, who got healed of leprosy. He wanted that all for himself. Motive, heart, thought, intent was not godly. And as we come into the final part of these parables, I just found it very interesting <laughs> That you will be picking up these parables again, different ones in Matthew 18 and 21. But as we are coming to the end of the parables in 55, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. And it closes this section of the parables. So he's, we just finished the separation at the end of the age. Now we are moving into 
Jesus experiencing separation from his family, from his friends, from his neighbors. We're going to see another separation. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where does this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't he his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Don't we know all his family? Who does he think he is? And if you want the deeper story, you go to Mark chapter 6. And we'll go there because I like the version that you read, uh, Gerald. It was very strong. If we can just turn to Mark 6, you will find that here is the parallel in Mark. And it's a bit stronger. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? That he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And what's interesting, as you read, Jesus makes a comment in 57. A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. In Mark, he said, only in his hometown among his relatives and his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at the lack of faith. You see, the other reality is kingdom currency. The kingdom of heaven currency is faith. It's believing in Jesus. It's believing in him. Believing in his word, believing in his way, believing that what he says is true and he is the yes and amen. But unbelief cancels out miracles. Unbelief cancels out miracles. And I can remember the first time I was praying for a healing of a young girl who had a tumor on her eye. And as I gathered, it was just in a youth group, and I had 16 girls there. And I said, okay, we're going we're gonna to pray for this young girl. And I ran all the way down to the church uh, altar to get some anointing oil, and I came back. And in that trip down and going back, the Lord told me, ask those who want to leave to leave. <laughs> I went, okay, Lord, I'll do that. And so I asked, I said, okay, kids, those of you that need to go or want to go, go. I was left with two girls. But we laid our hands on her, we anointed her with oil, prayed for her. And the next week when she came back, there was no more tumor. She was supposed to be in surgery and the next two days later, and she didn't need surgery. I had to remove unbelief out of the room. Lord, help us not be the people that have to be removed out of the room so God can do his work and his miracles. It's a sobering challenge to each one of us. And when I thought about that offense, many of us carry offenses if we can move on. What is an offense? It's, it's setting a snare, a stumbling block. It's to hinder right conduct or thought or cause to fall into a trap. We become trapped by carrying offense. See, moral damage is done by setting the trap, if you're the person setting the scheme going to trap somebody, or being trapped yourself in the offense and your unwillingness to forgive. And these are what 
The angels are told to weed out. Matthew 13, 14, weed out, take out everything causing sin, all scandals, all stumbling blocks, all lawbreakers, all who do evil. You see, the very same problem of weeds is encountered by Jesus himself. It's the sin of unbelief. And there's no pretending here. There's an outright rejection of Jesus, despite the evidence, despite the miracles, besides seeing all the things that he's done and hearing his wisdom, there are still people today that will reject Jesus. It's the seed that fell on the hard ground. It never found a place to take root and to grow. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. John 1, 11 to 13. He was despised and rejected of men. Isaiah 53, 3. Are you feeling that today? <laughs> Are you feeling despised and rejected? We get into those situations. Whether it's people at work, whether it's our families, whether we've chosen to stand for Jesus and now we're taking the, the brunt of the persecution that is coming. Jesus suffered the same and he knows what you're going through and he will strengthen you. So in conclusion, the kingdom of heaven realities is that kingdom has a time frame. Let's not waste our time. The time we've been given. The kingdom is real and it's costly. Are you willing to pay the price for following Jesus? The kingdom has net value. It separates. It makes judgments about what is good and evil. The kingdom will purge all gross and net evil. And the kingdom has old and new treasure. And most importantly, the currency of the kingdom of heaven is faith. Father, we want to thank you today for helping us to understand on this journey, Lord, that we're on is that there are kingdom realities of following you. There are kingdom realities for those who don't follow you. And Lord, I pray tonight that, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you will strengthen us so that, Father, we can walk in your kingdom with your strength, by your grace, to overcome all the offenses and challenges that we face in this life. Help us, Lord, not to get trapped in the cycle of offense. Help us, Lord, to believe, Father. Grant us that grace to believe you for the impossibilities that are before us. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God of breakthrough. You are the God of miracles. Help us, Lord to submit to your authority, to believe you for the impossible. And Lord, may you be with us this week as we journey with you in Jesus' name.